today, with our panel, and we have a little over an hour in which to hear from our distinguished panelists. I, am, I will introduce them very rapidly. You have their full CVs in your book, so I won't take up too much time. Uh, starting with John Kilama on my left, who is Kilama International Consulting Group. So that's a, a knowledge-based uh, company dealing with consulting services. Uh, on my immediate left, Jacques-François Martin. Welcome, dear friend. To, so happy to welcome you again here. It's uh, for Part Europe, and we'll hear more about that in a moment. And then uh, we have uh, on my right, uh, Christopher Henschel, who uh, is from the uh, Swiss Foundation for uh, Medicines. And if I am correct, I'll come back to that one as my, one of my first questions. Uh, you were also involved with, with malaria vaccines at, at some point. Am I correct on that? Yeah. Well, you're correct that I was involved with malaria research. Research, okay. Uh, although it was that, drugs more than vaccines. Okay, then I'll come to that in a moment. And uh, then uh, on my uh, far right, uh, Christian Fassot, uh, who is the VP for Medical Affairs of Sanofi. Uh, so, uh, let me start then uh, with uh, uh, Christopher Henschel. Uh, uh, we talked about uh, uh, malaria, malaria research. We know that uh, big pharmaceutical companies have invested an enormous amount in research. And yet, the feeling was that malaria was not really well tackled until uh, uh, the Gates Foundation and WHO got together. Is that a correct image or a wrong one? Was the private sector involved in more uh, than that, or did it require uh, public funding, public both philanthropic and state funding, to make it worthwhile for talent to go into tackling that problem? Uh, well, first, thank you for the question. Um, before I go into the question, I would like to just make one thank you myself, um, and, and that is a thank you to the background staff who helped put this meeting together because I don't think it's been mentioned before but as a person who's been involved in, in talking with them they have done an absolutely exemplary job and I hope that message will be uh, carried to them but now to go to your <laughs> um, to go to your question no it isn't quite true what you say in fact there have been um, a series of periods in malaria research and malaria drug research. Many people think that the 1960s was a, a sort of golden age. Um, at that time, many of the major European pharmaceutical companies engaged in research and were involved in, in the development of some very successful drugs. The motivation in the 1960s, however, was a bit different. Um, You've got to remember this was just the end of the colonial era. Uh, many European companies still had a history of developing products for Europeans who were going into tropical climes and so on, and so they had quite an incentive. But actually the commercial return on malaria research dropped completely and it didn't become worth doing so that there was a period of neglect in the 1970s, 1980s and it didn't really get stimulated in a major way until around 2000 through the uh, public-private partnerships and at that point certainly the Gates Foundation, other philanthropic foundations and development agencies starting, started putting money to uh, stimulate the pipeline and, and actually uh, within my, my last job, because I haven't actually told you <laughs> that I've recently changed jobs, um, I was running an organization that developed the largest pipeline of anti-malarial drugs in history during a period of 10 years. So it's now a second golden age and drugs are coming out of it. Well, that's very encouraging to know. Uh, but then this question underlines the need for public-private partnerships mm -hmm. in dealing with diseases, especially uh, you know, when we go beyond infectious diseases to non-communicable diseases, NCDs, where uh, invariably uh, uh, 
this seems to be expanding as, uh, as an impact in developing countries. They're no longer rich people's country uh, diseases, and, uh, and uh, that will require something that is affordable, something that can reach a large base, and so on. And uh, so, Christian uh, Fassat, Sanofi, what do you see uh, in that area for dealing with uh, the 80 percent of humanity that are still in developing countries? I mean, even though China and maybe some others are moving rapidly up, but still, what do you think? Well, I would like to start saying that uh, to me, developing countries is probably not the right word to use because uh, those countries are still Yes, in many instances developing, but they are also fast growing in many aspects. And of course, one would think about uh, the business aspect, but the economy in general, but also in R&D. So research and development in those developing countries, fast growing countries, whatever you call them, uh, is not emerging at all. It's already uh, present. And so this is, a, this is a component that we have to, uh, to uh, take into consideration. So back to your introduction, I think that uh, pharmaceutical companies um, um, in general are not the big one you have been describing necessarily. We Yes, we are big by size, but we try also to be small when we are locals. And so uh, what are we uh, looking for? I think we are looking for collaboration on three different uh, topics. First of all, on scientific ground first, uh, meaning uh, very early in the development process, in the research pro process, or can we collaborate with uh, uh, local institutions uh, on very scientific platforms. Second is, of course, to uh, create those partnerships, those ventures, and there we are more uh, uh, talking about developing um, uh, those collaboration development aspects. And, and third, of course, yes, we are in business, we are pharmaceutical companies, and so we are also interested to develop a business partnership partnership to develop those products. So uh, how do we tackle that? First of all, we try to be uh, where, where it makes sense to be. And uh, many, in many emerging countries, in many developing countries or fast-growing countries, uh, as you said, we have been putting uh, organizations in place. We have a scouting organization. We have fully loaded uh, R&D uh, organizations in many of those countries, not only in clinical development, but also also in uh, what we call scouting or partnership development uh, in order just to, um, to, uh, to tackle those points. We have also been delocalizing the clinical trials that we are doing and uh, not only because it makes sense uh, from a cost point of view, but uh, more importantly because it makes sense from a medical need point of view. And uh, this brings me to, to, to a second point, which is uh, in those developing countries, you were tackling malaria, which is an obvious example, but there are many other examples, HIV, dengue, tuberculosis. You have specific needs, and those specific needs need to be addressed one way or the other. So it is obvious to say you are not going to do uh, malaria development uh, in Europe. You do uh, development and research on malaria, where uh, malaria is, uh, is endemic, of course, and you try to, uh, to cope with, uh, with those needs uh, as such. So, uh, of course, there are many developing yes. countries, as you said, huh? and the world, it's a big part of the world. So how do we look at, those, at this world, and how do we select how to how and where to... But you're open to delocalization and to building partnerships with uh, sure. smaller companies all over the world? Absolutely. This is not uh, open and this is what we are doing. And, uh, and uh, you know, pharmaceutical companies do not uh, own uh, science. Science exists uh, is, uh, outside pharmaceutical companies, obviously. So partnership <coughs> is important and not only with big centers, also with uh, smaller centers. And, and so um, how do we, how do we uh, look at this and how do we place those trials? There are, I think, uh, five factors that uh, come into consideration there to, uh, to put research or to put development. The first one is the innovative capability of the, of the countries. And, uh, and for this, there are some key performance indi indicators that are but, clear. But usually it varies enormously. I mean, uh, uh, innovation capability can be very high in some sectors and uh, weak in other sectors yes. in all countries and 
even more so in some of the poor developing countries where you can find them innovating in one area. So uh, uh, would you try to win over people who are innovative in one area to come to work with you in your area? Or would you say, no, I want to see an established capability in that country in the area that I'm interested in? But I, I, I think, yes, it's a, it's a variable geometry, obviously, but uh, nevertheless, there are common denominators. There are common uh, pre-requirements that, that needs to be done there, of course, huh? and, and innovative capabilities, one, I mean that, uh, you know, uh, when you look at the different countries and they, they are uh, growth uh, uh, expenditures in, in R&D, it's not by chance, it's not by serendipity uh, that uh, China is number one, and you find some, uh, you know, direct uh, research in, in China. The total patents that are granted are also, uh, you know, Yes, but with a country markets. that produces uh, 672,000 scientists and engineers every year, mm -hmm. I would expect that there would be a lot more patents than you would find in Benin or Togo or that's Bissau. I mean, that's, that's obvious. I mean, so the, 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 there's also a question of size, number of institutions, number of individuals working, uh, and so on. But we'll come back to the rest of these. Let me ask <laughs> on these points that were raised, I'd like the comments from uh, Jacques Francois and, and from uh, well, I, I, I think what uh, Chris said before um, should lead us to a consideration which for me is very basic. We have heard yesterday from uh, G. Lomen or Philip Gorelsky this morning uh, about the complexity uh, of life. And I, I believe addressing the health needs of the world represents also a challenge of complexity. I mean, you cannot consider that you will be successful globally as an international community just because one of the partners is going to deliver. You need a full continuum which starts with innovation in universities, to some extent in biotech, etc., through the, the development, the medical development, the delivery, the financing, uh, and not to, to forget uh, the production uh, issues, etc. So, I believe partnerships are essential because there is nobody in the world today which is able to secure the whole continuum, the whole chain. And we will be only as good as the weakest part of this continuum. And therefore, the, the notion of public-private partnership is essential. I, I don't believe that we have today more scientific uh, assets than we had 10 years ago when you started or when uh, MDV started or uh, when Gavi started 10 years ago. We have delivered more because we have got organized in, in a different way based on a true partnership in which everybody is delivering its part of it. And I believe that's going to be key for many things. Look at the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria. It's exactly the same. And to take a simple example to, to, to show how important it is, in, in the late 90s, we had a, a very good vaccine against measles at a cost of 15 cents of a dollar a dose. So you cannot say that the price was a problem. And 800,000 of children were dying every year because they were not protected. We had the tools, just we were not organized to deliver. And it's because an initiative has been taken where the prescribers have got together with the producers and the, those who are delivering, etc., that today the number of children dying from measles, 10 years later only, is less than 200,000. So it's a tremendous achievement because of the partnership. That's good. John, do you, I mean, do you see that uh, openness uh, that our colleagues have expressed, or do you see that it's slightly, from a slightly different perspective? Uh, let, before I respond to that, I wanted to actually thank you so much, uh, Ismail, for your leadership. Leadership matters. Uh, Absolutely. And one of the things which we are really missing today in the global arena is the lack of leadership that we have seen over the last uh, 10 years uh, after Mandela has uh, left the scene of the leadership. And people like you actually provide hope that indeed as we try to look at our world and try to make it better, it actually makes me very proud. 
Now, you, you may not realize this, Ismail, but you're actually serving two worlds. And that is you are offering opportunities for young Arab students. Uh, at the same time, you're offering opportunities for the Africans. And, and I think that is a marvelous thing to do because uh, Asia today would not be where it is if Japan had not been a very strong leader in the Asian world, waiting for the others to catch up. And I think this is needed both in the Arab world as well as in Africa. A country need to step up and become the leader in which others begin to follow. And I think you are demonstrating that right here uh, in Alexandria, and I appreciate that very much. Now, to, to, the, to the issue of PPPs, or the three Ps, uh, I, I think if we begin to understand it from a simplistic approach, and that is no one in the world has everything they need. They have to get something from somebody else, uh, which means uh, cooperation become, cooperating become very important. There are certain things that the public sector offers that the private sector does not have, and there are certain things the private sector offers that uh, the public sector does not have. Like and, what? I'm sorry? Like what? Give us an example of what the uh, uh, public sector has that the private sector doesn't Well, uh, let, let me, example. especially when we're talking about uh, pharmaceutical products, so let, let's take a look at the, the NIH, for example. The, 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 that model is a very important model. Yeah. The NIH is not supported by the private sector. It's supported by the public sector. The U.S. government provides them enormous amount of money. The outcomes of the activities within the NIH is passed on to the private sector. What is the, what is the reasoning behind it? The reasoning behind it is, is that there is an institution called the private sector which is very good in developing and at the same time bringing something to the market. Now, because they are selling it doesn't mean that it's not a public service. Imagine if we do not have anybody manufacturing the chairs that you're sitting on. Well, you won't have it out there. So there is a way in which the fact that the private sector engaged in, in making money and, and providing the services in, in, in itself a public service. And so I think that is a very good example that we ought to take a look at the, the relationship between the, the, the National Institute of Health and the private sector. There are so many drugs that has gone through the, the NIH, has been developed by the private sector and it created economic development, provided jobs for families. Families then use their job to, to support their families. So yes. that, that is the concept I think I like people to begin to. Okay, but then, to. then we have to also recognize, for example, that in the United States, since you picked the example of the NIH, uh, which is a wonderful institution, and uh, we've had many of their uh, presidents come and uh, speak here. Uh, Harold Barmas, others who came and spoke, speak here in, in, in Alexandria. Uh, the fact is that uh, health care in the United States is enormously expensive. It's taking a huge part of GDP, certainly more so than most European countries, uh, just not to compare it with, with uh, emerging market countries. <coughs> and yet in terms of uh, output of the services received are not necessarily the best in terms of life expectancy at birth as a measurement, for example, of or one of the, the, the measurements that could be uh, uh, used for overall uh, uh, health indicators, both from hygiene, from schooling, from uh, treatment, uh, uh, preventive, and as, a, as, a, as one, if I have to pick one. So at, at uh, any rate, uh, yes, the power of research has been Great and power development has also been great. But there's a number of other policies aren't there, and that comes back to, to Christian's earlier point that when you said the indica five indicators and so on, uh, the overall policies of the country have a lot to do with whether or not uh, the product and the innovation is taken up or whether it languishes. Whether, as, as Jacques Francois said, the, the you have the tools, but somehow it's not reaching the people. 
it's not just the absence of people capable of doing it, it's also the policy framework. Yeah. So what would you recommend uh, from your experiences to advance the uptake, because after all this is a conference on linking science to society, what are the things that you would recommend that governments uh, should take up as policies in order to help move the impact of science and innovation to society as effectively as possible? Yes. Obviously, oh. I have no, no pretension to, <laughs> to advise government on, uh, on policy making, but uh, just to provide perhaps some, some reflections on what we, what we see from our experience in, uh, in, uh, within the pharmaceutical industry uh, in those countries and indeed what makes the difference and what are the different approaches that are taken also by, by different emerging countries. So uh, first of all, uh, just to remind everyone, but uh, it's, it's obvious, but I think it needs to be reminded that uh, the world out there is a competitive one. And I mean also in research and development and basic and mainly in research, the, the world is very competitive. So uh, this is an important piece of information. So what are the key factors uh, that, that lead to, to success? I think that uh, the first one is to have at uh, governmental uh, um, level a very clear vision of uh, the strategy. Where do we want to go in this country with uh, uh, research and development? And so saying, what are the priorities that we want to push forward? And obviously you cannot push everything forward. You cannot be uh, good at everything, so you have to be selective, I think, in uh, what are really the assets of, of, of the country. Uh, and, and there we are coming back to, uh, to what are really the, the, the epidemiological needs, the medical needs, because very often the assets that you have in research and development are really motivated by the needs you have in the country. And, and so if you have a tuberculosis problem, uh, yes, uh, probably you are going to, uh, to work more on tuberculosis or on malaria, whatever, than on HIV or the opposite. So I think this is priority setting, clear strategic vision. I think that uh, one, one key point uh, from my experience is to, to have some coordinating body, to have an agency or a, a forum or whatever it is that is coordinating the research and development efforts at the country level is very important. First, to avoid competition, internal competition between different centers in the same countries. So why, why would I avoid competition? Uh, between different centers if different researchers may in fact uh, be motivated by coming yes. up with new but ideas. And yes, then. competition is good when, uh, when, uh, when you have cross-fertilization. That was going to be my point. I think that this kind of coordination might also, you know, and that was, I think, your point. We, we cannot succeed alone. You have to, uh, to create today networks. So research and development today is not, uh, it's not a matter of one lab or one academy or one university. It is networking. And, and network in, in R&D is very important. But that work, network means some competition to start, but also then very quickly to move to synergistic approaches and not spending time repeating what the other one have done already or are doing already. So this is, uh, I think, very, very important. And I think that a very clear message is also that investing in R&D is, is providing direct benefits to the country in terms of education, in terms of diversification of the economy, in terms of public health, etc., etc. So, I mean, the structure to, to put around needs also, need also to, uh, to tackle yeah, those Yeah, but ones. translating R&D into uh, immediate benefits uh, for society is not the same. It can, it can contribute to generating growth in some cases, but it can also contribute to generating inequalities, which generate a system whereby uh, a, an underclass gets created in a particular country and they're left further and further behind. The gaps grow. We've seen that in a number of cases. So the, the policies, yes, R&D is inherently good and useful and important because of the educational and the values that it brings to society. And it also links now increasingly with the global network of, uh, of research. Nobody really works completely alone. But Chris, what about your well, view? At some level, I think we have to admit the limitations of, of therapeutic interventions. If, mm. if you look at exactly. the, the big picture today globally in public health, a lot of it is being driven by lifestyle issues. I mean, yes. the most obese 
teenagers in the world today are in Mexico. The, the place which has most diabetes is an area around the Middle East where the... Yeah, we are, we're number nine in Egypt and apparently moving up the list as well. Right? <laughs> Told uh, the, so smoking. people, watch there, out. There, there, are, there are all kinds of lifestyle things which are not directly affected by, by medical uh, interventions and certainly policies and education which is really the domain of the government is incredibly important there. I mean, we know in, in the UK, for example, that heart disease has dropped dramatically uh, as a result of um, lifestyle changes and, and much less lung cancer due to smoking. So I think, first of all, we have to say that that is the domain of the government and that there's a lot of catch-up to be done in the developing world because the people who are living longest now not only have the best medical intervention, they have the best lifestyles as well, on mm. average. And it's making a huge difference. I mean, if you, if you look at the global picture of longevity today, for the first time in human history, you have an almost 50-year difference in life expectancy between a female born in certain parts of Africa and a female born in Japan. So in Japan, you can expect to live as a female to about 86 or 87. In the, some parts of Africa, you can expect to live 30, uh, 50 years less than that. So this is the first time in human history where we've had such, such big differences. True. No, you, you're absolutely right, and I think it's very important that there is, um, actually, I, I, I once gave a lecture to uh, at their invitation, a group of medical doctors, and I called it public health and private medicine. And uh, the fact is that uh, these two fields became separated uh, in the early 20th century uh, when uh, the first time, I think it was in Johns Hopkins, if I'm not mistaken, that the first school of public health was made independent of the school of medicine. And then from that time onwards, the notion of looking at the overall health of entire populations as opposed to the treatment of particular individuals started diverging, and in fact, in some cases, uh, and uh, when I worked at the World Bank, I was involved with that frequently, we would find countries uh, where uh, Congo Brazzaville in the early 80s, for example, 55% of the entire health budget went to the hospital in Brazzaville, which meant that the entire countryside, there were no dispensaries, no medicines, no... <laughs> <laughs> nursing, no equipment, no that. So the balancing between the two is important. Tomorrow we will be talking about the, the, uh, the science super course, and I'm happy to see my colleagues involved in that sitting there, where we're trying to spread, to, we started with the network of epidemiology that uh, Dr. Ron Laporte there uh, generated with WHO and the University of Pittsburgh, and it spread to other fields of science where we're trying, in fact, to involve people all over the world in, in knowing more about precisely these issues, how ep epidemics uh, stretch, how other, th but the lifestyle that you're talking about has become a very central part of that. Now, we've talked about medicine and health, but that's not the only application of the life sciences. Uh, there's also the issue of uh, food security, agriculture, the environment, the, the potential for energy applications. Uh, and in a lot of that, there are issues, again, of the public and the private, and certain things that require regulation. And I think that was one of your points, Chris, that in fact lifestyle changes uh, will frequently require regulations about uh, uh, labeling of foods, the kind of things you can put in them, the raising taxes on cigarettes and uh, 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 banning uh, smoking in public areas, uh, many other devices, and other things where private initiative can uh, lead the way and, and run. Uh, in these other fields, like food security, agriculture, industry to reduce pollution, moving from chemical to biological processes, for example, do you see a role for government and the private sector, and how do you see such roles? Um, let me start by giving a very simple example. Uh, 
uh, well, it may not be very simple. Uh, we are seated here, and uh, the reason besides the leadership, uh, there is the infrastructure. You've got a nice facility here where people can be able to participate in the event. And you can translate this and, as well. And, and everything we're saying is being televised. So. So a much bigger audience than That's the one right. that is here. <laughs> the camera is there in the back. That's right. And, and what, what has really happening or has happened in developing countries, let's say in Africa, is that I'm not just talking about roads and highway and stuff like that. I'm talking about the infrastructure for research and development. In order to be able to form a partnership with the private sector and create a product out of your output. It requires certain basic infrastructure which is necessary for, for the private sector to operate. Let me give you one example. There are some participants here from Kenya and they are very familiar with the story of an enzyme that was isolated from Naivasha geyser. Uh, by Procter and Gamble. Today that enzymes is what most of us, if not everyone, actually use in the form of soap, detergent, for laundry. Now imagine that there was a little bit of research infrastructure where they were able to isolate this mic able to isolate these enzymes form a partnership with the private sector and move this product into where they are making billions of dollars. It would make enormous difference to a country like Kenya. I can also say with certainty right now, in several laboratories in Africa, there sits a compound which could actually cure a lot of diseases but it isn't going to come out there because there is no kind of infrastructure to facilitate that process to take place because the private sector can operate in that kind of environment. So I think in order for partnership to occur, it has to be reciprocal. It can't just be one way. Okay, that's, that's after all the definition of a partnership. I, I think a useful thing to explain, I mean, I see a lot of uh, young people in this audience that they may not fully understand how complicated it is in the pharmaceutical industry to discover, develop, and deliver a genuine new drug. And I think the easiest way of explaining it is, first of all, to say how much it costs, because now it's costing more than a billion dollars per drug. But perhaps even more impressive is how few countries have managed to do it. Fewer countries have managed to do it than the number of countries that have managed to create atomic weapons. Essentially the US, a few European countries, and Japan, and nobody else. I'm talking at, at about at an international uh, regulatory level. There are many people who have done parts of the value chain, but it is only US, a few European countries, and Japan that entirely within one country have discovered, developed, and launched a product at an international level. That tells you how complicated it is. And when you, you, know, you hear, let's say, there is a part of the value chain in Africa, it's absolutely true. But it is only going to see the light of day if it joins forces with, with other partners. Now, I have, I have made this statement at a number of meetings, and always somebody jumps up and says, Ah, but what about drug X? Wasn't that discovered and developed? They very often cite artemisinin, which, yes. is, which is a malaria drug. Well, what happened with artemisinin? It was discovered in China as a natural product. But actually, the development and the distribution at an international level was done by Novartis in Switzerland. And you see this again and again. There are very, very few countries that have the total competence or the companies that are large enough to pay billions of dollars for, for research. Let me right. give you another number. $200 billion or more 
is spent within pharmaceutical companies a year in doing product research in the research-based pharmaceutical industry. These are huge numbers, and very, very few people can, can actually do it. So partnership is the only way. Yeah, well, that's true. But it's also equally true that large pharmaceutical companies spend very large budgets on advertising. This is also true. And uh, on marketing, yeah, yeah. and uh, that true. they have uh, an international reach uh, in terms of markets that uh, make it uh, uh, make market entry difficult, not just beyond the, 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 the cost barrier, but also in terms of the ability to enter and with new products. There's but also a fact that I think everybody here would, would acknowledge that uh, a number of companies uh, in biotechnology, for example, have been buying startups, and that uh, the, some of the startups uh, basically do not expect to grow to become the new Pfizer or the new Sanofi. They, they expect, cannot. in fact, to sell themselves. They cannot. They, but they expect to sell themselves off to somebody else who will buy them off on some point. Because it's too expensive to, to fully develop a drug. I mean, as a startup, in the best case, you go up to phase two. That's considered as the optimum for return on your investment. Yeah, yeah, but the phase three uh, are involving... Jack Francois, Jack, explain phase three. Well, phase, phase two is, is a fa or phase one is safety. You check if your vaccine or your drug is safe and doesn't harm. Phase two is the proof of concept, the clinical proof of concept on a limited number of patients. Uh, after that, the size of the next step, which is the proof of concept on a very important population to make sure that statistically you would not put in evidence, and that's not always given, any side effects which is seldom but could be very, very, uh, very serious. It costs so much today that small companies, it is exceptional today that a, a biotech can get it to a fully integrated company, you know, as, as you rightly said. I mean, uh, Last year, the FDA has licensed 24 drugs for the whole year, 24. And if you look at all the expenses uh, in the same year for product research, you, you see how expensive it is. So you, you need this kind of partnership. But I, I'd like, if you allow, to, to come back on, on your, your precedent question on what would you expect from the governments, uh, etc. For a partnership to work, you need a, a number of things. But the first one, I think, is a vision. And this is also very important for the private sector because you, you, you will be reticent to invest if you don't have a reasonable hope that you will be able to recoup your cost over a certain period of time. And if you are not convinced that the prescribers the prescribers, it goes from the governments up to the medical doctors, uh, will uh, in, in fact endorse uh, the prescription of your product, you will be very reticent. So I, I, I think if we want to tackle diabetes seriously, you know, for instance, somebody, and that's the second point, has to say we really want to tackle this issue globally and make sure that all the, the efforts are being developed in a way which would optimize the corresponding investment. By the way, this raises a, a, a second issue, I think, uh, which has been addressed, I believe, in the case of uh, MV, MMV and, and in, in the case of Gavi uh, relatively well also. The, the fact that we need these partnerships involving a number of constituencies raises uh, a very important question of governance. In many cases, we are not organized in order to uh, optimize this global work together, you know? We, we, we heard this morning in a, in a workshop about patents and, and WIPO trying to uh, establish uh, or facilitate ac just access to information, for instance, to allow people working in certain fields to determine their freedom of operation. We could give many of these kind of examples where the, 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 the things are not spontaneously getting together in the appropriate way. And that's why I think that these kind of, of events like uh, BioVision here in Lyon are very important in bringing together the different constituencies 
for them to become aware, yes, I have a part of the global responsibility, and I have to do a certain number of things myself in order to make it happen. I, I cannot count just on the other. We could give many other examples, also in the field of clinical development in the field. Of, but the, the vision and the governance uh, are two, uh, two, two issues which, for me, are, are very important for uh, the success of a partnership. Any, I don't think any of us would, uh, would disagree with that, except that perhaps uh, the word the vision is, uh, is uh, a bit uh, uh, lacking in definition. Uh, I think it's a long-term uh, goal, long-term yeah, uh, target. I think, I think, I think uh, the willingness to, to give priority to certain fields and to stay committed to them would be yes. probably yeah. closer. Yeah. Yeah. But, but uh, I think we, we, we've touched upon now something that there is a role for the public and, and a role for the private sector. And the private sector, yes, the large companies have a big role to play and they're not really the bad guys uh, the way uh, they are portrayed in much of the media and uh, okay. or in fact that they've been subjected to campaigns by uh, various uh, civic groups around the world. Nevertheless, it is uh, equally true that uh, at some point uh, there are certain things that the private sector will not do. And uh, going beyond drugs, uh, there are many other areas. We talked about public health and lifestyles. But if you look at environment, you look at other things, it is true that to have a functioning global system or regional or local system, we need regulation. We need a strong state. We, we need the ability to have uh, contracts, laws, courts, uh, uh, enforcement. I mean, there's a whole range of things, uh, not just, you know, uh, governs best that governs least, leave everything to be done uh, by, by whoever and whatever. And uh, Adam Smith, of course, uh, uh, the, the, the famous for his... Uh, which is probably the one line that everybody quotes from that huge uh, amount of work that he produced is that the invisible hand that allows uh, uh, private entrepreneurs or capitalists to pursue their interest and somehow get an optimal outcome for society. He also spoke about what today in economic jargon we would call public goods and recognized that public goods are not going to be the uh, result of private investment uh, because of what was said, the private investor has to recoup his benefit. And thus there are questions that emerge as to how to design the regulation. And it seems to me uh, that this is something that doesn't take uh, enough attention. There's too much attention to sort of uh, market versus state. Uh, somehow, you know, too much regulation. Uh, not enough regulation, not asking what sort of regulation is required. I don't think any of the private sector uh, 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 diehards would question the need for enforcement courts, laws uh, that are equally enforced by, uh, on everybody, that are transparent, known in advance, etc. So that's a form of regulation. Uh, also, I think we would say that there are some needs for public health uh, and safety standards uh, for the public that should be available. But the, the type of regulation that would allow these partnerships to flourish is not sufficiently discussed. It, is, it tends to become polarized into no regulation or we need to regulate. Or, and, and I think this is something we need your inputs in. I think it's very important when you talk about regulation in the pharmaceutical industry to, to understand that it is one of the contributors to the cost, to the billion. An dollars. essential one. An essential one, but one has to understand that the amount of data you have to produce today to get a stringent regulator to approve a drug is more than ever in history. The size of the clinical trials uh, are larger and it's, it's more and more expensive. And it's all done, obviously, because you don't want to introduce products into the market that are unsafe or are discovered to have unsafe side effects at some later point. 
But there is no no-risk strategy in, in research. So it's, a, it's finding the right balance. Now, the, there are two elements. The one is the uh, legal regulation, which is very, very large in, in the pharmaceutical industry. But there's also a, a secondary level of self-imposed regulation. For example, all products made that go through stringent regulators adopt something called the ICH guidelines, which were developed between WHO and the pharmaceutical, the research-based pharmaceutical industry. And these, are, these are not necessarily legal regulations, but these are guidelines that the industry itself has adopted because of the science. This is a very important point. You have to do something that is scientifically justified because the more regulation, the more cost. And the ICH guidelines, on the whole, have produced a series of drugs which have been largely safe. I mean, every now and then we find something comes out and there's a rare example of a, a side effect, but it's been largely safe. So I have to say that the WHO has also recently introduced a secondary way of trying to introduce products for the developing world, which is called their pre-qualification pre scheme. Mm. And this scheme largely mimics the ICH and the stringent regulators, but it isn't exactly the same. One of the things that is obviously true is that many countries do not like to be judged by other countries. So if yes. a, let's say, a Chinese company is producing a drug, it doesn't want to be judged by the American FDA or the European EMEA. Uh, so how do you get round that? You have to have a neutral body that has a series of regulations. And WHO is trying to do this. Yes. But it's right at the beginning of this. And it's quite controversial. Quite a lot of people from the industry side think that it isn't actually as stringent yes. as, as the real stringent regulators. But, but part yeah. of the stringency is also due, I think, to uh, a general lack of understanding uh, in many parts of the world, and especially in the Western world, which is uh, fed by the media, of uh, plain statistics. Because when I say to someone, uh, well, we have a new drug, and we tested it on 10,000 people, and uh, one person died, and uh, out of the remaining uh, 9,999, uh, 9,750 uh, were, were cured, and uh, the remaining 149 had no effects. Wow, that's a wonderful drug, we should accept it. Next thing you know, now you're reaching a million people, and 100 people have died. Well, that's still one in 10,000. But when you reach a law of large numbers, then all of a sudden the media say, how could you possibly approve a drug where uh, 100 people have died? Well, it was already in the statistics. It's one in 10,000. Hasn't, that hasn't changed. It's not that we're discovering something new. But this law of large numbers, uh, which shifts from a trial where we're talking in percentages to suddenly an observation in absolute numbers of negative cases is probably one of the reasons that has been driving public acceptance or lack thereof of what constitutes uh, a risk. I mean, uh, under these kinds of rules, we would never have had automobiles. We probably would have never been able to, to have aircraft because they went through a long period of testing. Uh, and, and, uh, but somehow I think that the, there is also a, a, a feeling uh, that we are becoming more risk averse with the passage of time. Is that feeling well, correct or not? Roughly it's true, but I have to say that one shouldn't assume that because one person dies, a, a drug will be prevented. There is a, a, a risk benefit analysis built into the regulatory systems, certainly in the US and in Europe. And the other very important thing to say is that uh, registration of drugs is a sovereign issue. So the fact that 
a drug is approved in Europe doesn't mean that you know, the Egyptian regulatory well, body will or will not. It's the totally FDA doesn't market approve market certain market drugs market. in Europe and Europeans. Yeah. I would disagree on uh, that. But I want to, sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, I, 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 just I, as a clarification, I didn't say that it would be prevented under 1 to 10,000. I'm simply saying that you could approve a drug in a case of 1 to 10,000, and then after it's applied and there are 100 cases then the media picks up how can you have how could you have possibly approved this drug because there's a hundred cases even though we, we, you could say well but now there's a million people who are taking it and there's so many who are better off it's it's the perception uh, that comes afterwards when the law of large numbers begins to set in there's a particular yeah. problem in yeah. the u.s because yes. of the the liability legislation That's there right. where, where companies can be yeah. very very so tort reform is yes, yes. okay about yeah, uh, it's an interesting discussion, at least from my perspective, also being a, a, clini a clinical person in a, a clinical setting. Let me try to address that issue a little bit. First of all, uh, before a tolidomide case, uh, yes. industry was not really well regulated. And I think tolidomide, most, for those in the audience who don't know that, was a, was a drug that was approved in Germany, I believe, in uh, Europe. But, uh, where anyway it had disastrous results on uh, pregnant women and yeah, children right. who were and born children, deformed. Right. And since that time, there's been a major effort to... Right. Uh, and, and in my opinion, uh, there has to be a very stringent regulations on, on drug uh, introduction into society because uh, the, the effect of drugs sometimes, before you realize is actually very damaging to society. It could take 10, 15, 20, 30 years. Uh, a good example is the COX-2 inhibitors, uh, which is a Cerebrex, uh, cere uh, cere uh, cere I think that's what it is, from Pfizer, which actually, when people took that particular medication, uh, those who had some kind of borderline heart problems actually died for, for taking that medication and it has to be withdrawn, although it's not totally withdrawn from, from clinical settings. It is, only, it is very, uh, very well regulated in terms of who should get it. Now, can I just say something about pharmaceutical industry that I think is very important for... Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Pharmaceutical industry has been the, the most successful research and development industry in the world today. And I think the benefits of that uh, success is why there is a lot of longevity in some societies, although it hasn't really benefited some of the less uh, fortunate. But some people would say, you know, it's, a, yeah, it's successful, but, you know, compared to the computer industry, for example. Well, <laughs> I think, for example, <laughs> the most successful, uh, but anyways, it is successful. Well, okay, what I'm on. talking about, for example, the vaccines, yeah. okay, has been a very successful phenomenon. Uh, in, in many ways. The other thing that we need to know about the pharmaceutical is that the product of the pharmaceutical is not directly consumed by the consumers. It has to be prescribed, prescribed for you. And in some cases, somebody has to pay it for you, which is very different from a lot of products that are produced by many industries. And therefore, the complexity of it is something we can't just use simple description in terms of uh, talking about the pharmaceutical industry. The other thing which we also need to know is that the relationship between the prescriber and the producer, which in itself sometimes can be a problem. It could be created by the prescriber, which the industry probably facilitate to do that. And all these complexities really should not be taken in a simplistic way because as successful as they have, there are definitely some issues in terms of sure. how the utilization of the drug is. The other thing that sometimes I also find is that people think that somehow pharmaceutical industry is one of the richest industry in the world. That is not the case. In fact, if I ask you, of the top 10 richest industry, 
Where do you think the pharmaceutical, any taken a Johnson, Pfizer, where do you think they fall in? Do you think they fall within their hundreds? How many people think they are within the hundred? No, they are probably close to about 150. So there are about 150 companies in the world that are much far richer than a pharmaceutical company. So what, what I'm trying to get at is that sometimes we are very critical of the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah, but, but, but we're, we're beyond that in this panel, so I don't think we're, <laughs> we're yeah. excessively but, critical. Yeah, but I, but I think, uh, Isma, I think we, we do need to understand that uh, there has been a tremendous benefit from the pharmaceutical industry. There's no question about that. There will still be. And it, there will still be. What, what is needed is the public sector now to step in and try to work with the private sector so that affordable drug can be produced and be generated in society. And the last thing before you go, before I go, is that in the case of Africa, where we could really participate in the discovery of drugs is in the process of getting what I call lead generations. Because 50% of the prescription drug today are of natural origin. That is from microbes, yeah. from plants, from various, and this is where African scientists are very good at. And again, it is going to require a certain organization at the ground level, whether it is a government, a university, they need to get that organization going so that they can be able to license these things to the industry and the industry can be able to produce this product. Uh, I'd like to come back on, on the issue uh, of uh, <coughs> safety and, and, and risk, etc. Basically, in order to be licensed by regulatory authority, uh, any product, pharmaceutical product, vaccine, etc., but I believe it's also true uh, in other sectors, has to prove safety and efficacy, at least. Right. Okay? And it remains a key question, how do we, as, as a global community, balance the risk on the safety side with the efficacy on the other side? This is particularly true for vaccines, which are generally given to people who are healthy, and you don't want to, particularly don't want to induce side effects with immunization. In the case of therapeutic drugs, you may be more inclined to accept certain side effects if it works very well. But it remains a key issue, I believe, for the world today to determine, and it's very difficult to get an answer, the, where you draw the line. And without any risk, the tendency of the regulatory authorities in the world in the last 20 years has gone very aggressively towards limiting risk or not taking any risk. And among the consequences, you have a reduction of new, new product, but you have particularly an increasing, increasing cost. And these increased costs are making the access more difficult, generally not so much in the rich countries because they can still afford, right, but in, in developing countries. And these debates here, uh, and, and uh, uh, our, our friend uh, Philippe Kourilski is, is a very uh, strong defender of reassessing this balance, is really, I think, a key issue. And we, we could have meetings of, of uh, BioVision to, to discuss that, but it remains a very important yeah. point. If you, right. if you allow me, Mr. Sherman, yes. to, to pick up on this one, I think this is, uh, this is only one point, uh, one item of the, of the whole debate. Of course, uh, risk-benefit is one very important point, and uh, it needs to be very uh, strongly regulated, obviously. And uh, the industry has been uh, not only participating to the definition of those uh, regulations, but demanding. And, and really contributing to, uh, to this process. And yes, uh, this prolongs the, the, the development. Yes, this, this increases the cost and, and all of this. But at the end, I think that we, we have today indeed uh, safer drugs on, on the market that we used to, to, to have in the past, generally speaking. Now, that being said, I think this is also, and by the way, there are today, I think, very few players, to your point, in the world that really uh, are capable to, to cure diseases. And most of those players are 
you want it or you, you, don't, you like it or you don't like it, but are mostly in the pharmaceutical industry. That being said, I think that the pharmaceutical industry has also to rethink the way it approaches research in order just to uh, tackle the risk-benefit ratio in a different ways. And, and, and uh, this is also true that in the past we have been uh, too much tackling, you know, me too or me too plus products and not looking uh, sufficiently at what really makes the difference in research. And today we are in translational research, we are in translational uh, medicine and we are trying to, even in the early phases of the research, just to increase the probability that the risk-benefit ratio will be better the day after, meaning that the targets we are looking at, the credentials we are looking at, have to have a certain magnitude of effect, a certain, um, let's say, difference-making, and, and, and difference-making in terms of sense also, in medical sense, uh, just to, to, to pursue those roads and to forget all the other ones. And I think if we if we all are able to do that, and this is not only uh, techniques, and this is not only requiring partnerships with the public sectors and between the public and the private, but it's a totally mindset change in the way research has to be, has to be or can be, uh, can be tackled. And I think if we are able to do that together, uh, this is probably going to uh, decrease the attrition rate in the R&D development today, more than 30 uh, compounds, uh, you know, are, are screened just to have one that uh, is going to, to enter into reg registration. And so we have to be more selective also on what we are doing. But, so, not, Chris, not, not, we, not, we not don't pursuing. need to bring out a violin for the pharmaceutical industry quite yeah. yet. But it is true that there are at least three important drivers which are reducing the profitability uh, of the industry, which you can easily check if you look at the share prices. Um, one is the patent cliff. Many of the blockbuster drugs that were actually sustaining the industry are coming to the end of their patent life. They Second, should innovate more. Yeah, yes, but let me, let me give you the three. One is you know, it's very difficult no, to no, get I another don't. Lipitor, it's very difficult to get these blockbuster drugs. Um, two, there are not so many low-hanging fruit today mm. for, the, for the industry to develop. It's more difficult to do Me Too drugs, as my colleague here has said. And three, the cost of doing research has been inexorably going up. So this reduction in profitability requires a bit of a change of strategy in the industry, and the best new strategy is to engage with emerging economies and develop new markets. Because today, 95% of sales of the pharmaceutical industry is in Europe, US, and Japan. Yeah, but that's, Just, not, that's normal. That's mm. given the price range of what that's yeah, yeah, it has to change. It must change. It must it change. It cannot we sell need, in poor we countries. Need, yeah. We need an industry which, which engages with so the whole speak. world, not just with the rich markets. And therefore, we need uh, both a change in the marketing, but also, as you said, both of you, a change in the mindset in, in, in research. And the uh, mindset in research, I mm. think, is... Uh, Part of what we need to, uh, to uh, address uh, here, uh, the, the, the fact that it is so expensive is one thing, but there's also uh, the fact, and I think Philippe Korinsky, you mentioned, uh, he spoke about, uh, he wrote a report actually, a very important report with a colleague of his that was presented to Prime Minister Jospin about the precautionary principle where he said yeah, the issue related. is not to show that there is uh, zero risk. In other words, there is there risk? Of course, there is some risk. But the issue is to compare the adopting a new technology versus continuation of the existing technology, because the alternative to adopting the new technology is not zero risk. It is the continuation of the present set of technologies which have known risks, measurable risks, and therefore that we should be making choices in that fashion. That report, of course, as you 
those of you who, who may know, was a big issue with the, not just with France, but with the European community as well. Yeah. So we are now in a phase where it's, it's global, but yes, it is true that uh, legislation and registration and patenting is still national and local. It is equally true that there is segmentation in the market between the rich countries and the poor countries, in terms of some in-betweens, obviously. It's equally true that there's an enormous growth in the so-called emerging economies in lieu of calling them developing countries. I mean, uh, where the advanced economies are growing at uh, uh, one percent to three percent maybe. Many of the developing countries or the emerging markets are growing at seven, eight percent, uh, maybe uh, in some cases nine uh, percent or more. It's equally true, true that the, there are new platforms for research. I mean, Singapore, as we all know, was, a, was not a very uh, advanced country in 1962, 63, 64, and now it has the, the highest per capita income right after Qatar, way ahead of everybody else in a country with no natural resources, not even with any water, it imports all its food, distills its water from the sea. They have a first-class platform uh, uh, in terms of, uh, of high technology research. So there are things that are changing, and that requires a change in mindset, as you said. So uh, to wrap this up, I would like to go to each person and say, what are your parting shots that you would like to say to the public, and you can look at the camera while you're saying that, uh, to the public, what are the, the thoughts that you would like the public to carry away from this discussion about how can we mobilize the life sciences for the benefit of society and how the private sector can help make that happen. So, please, John, would you start? A camera, short statement, and then we'll yes. move on to everybody else. So, so I think that um, pharmaceutical companies uh, are part of, um, part of the network, as I said, uh, that uh, is able today or should be able today really to, uh, to make advances for public health. And uh, public health means uh, really to, uh, to tackle the, uh, the, the medical needs that are huge and are also uh, untackled for, for many, uh, for many uh, parts uh, today. Uh, second is that uh, we should do that uh, all together in a responsible way, I think, uh, in the sense of uh, uh, social responsibility, uh, but also in the sense of uh, really, uh, um, how would I say, tackling the, uh, the topics uh, on, on developing things that are up that make, make sense, and make sense not, it does not mean only drugs that are available on the market, registered according to the guidelines of the regulations, but are more importantly making a difference to the patients, and to make a difference to the patients, they need to be affordable, otherwise That's they right. are useless. Otherwise they can't be used. Chris. Uh, I'm, I'm excited by a new concept which is now being developed in a few places in emerging countries, in emerging markets, and this, this is the concept of bio-cities, which are essentially research parks which embody the best practice of the public-private partnerships, but they also have uh, treatment facilities, so for example hospitals actually within the, within the park, and are able to do clinical research. And I think the, the great benefit of that vision compared to the public-private partnerships is that it helps capacity building in emerging economies. My slight disappointment with the, the traditional public-private partnerships is that it left all of the expertise in Europe or the US, even though one had to do clinical trials in Africa or Southeast Asia, and you might have trained a few people locally, Generally what happened is the trained people left. So you never helped capacity building. So I think the new vision is to try to use what we have learned, but to do it in emerging markets. In the emerging markets themselves. Yeah. Okay, thank you. John. Uh, my message is, is very clear, and, and I want to echo the emerging markets. But I'm going to back it up a little bit by statistics. Uh, in the case of Africa. I believe that in the next 20 years, the center of the universe is going to be in Africa, 
whether it is the people looking to try to find businesses, and it's already beginning to happen. Why? Because, for example, today, the GDP in 2008 of Africa combined was 1.6 trillion. And the, ex the, the expectation is that by the year 2020, there will be 1.4 trillion of dollars that will be spent on consumer goods. If I'm a private sector, I hear that kind of statistics. And this was done by McKinsey Research Institute. And I think some of you probably read the, the, the Lion, the African uh, uh, report. I think in the last 15 or more, over 20 countries in Africa had a GDP of 7% and higher, even much higher than when the tigers of the Asia was developing. And so not only can you participate in the research and development, you are very big consumers. And therefore, I think the pharmaceutical company need to realize the only way they are going to expand their horizon in terms of growth, it is in the continent of Africa. And I really urge them to begin to look at the different models to work for with marketing. Africa. Correct. Okay, thank you. Jacques Francois. Well, I, I'd like to say, uh, the motto of the conference is linking science to society. And I'm convinced many people when they will leave uh, this conference will be still more certain that uh, the future is going to bring uh, and the scientific progress of the future is going to bring a lot of wealth to, to the world. But having said that, I believe we should also not forget the other message, which is as of today, we have already tools, we have already possibilities which we are far from using as it should in order to organize the better world. And if we were able to define the appropriate priorities, if we were able to find the appropriate organizations and, and leadership, I believe we could already today substantially improve the situation and we all carry a part of the responsibility to make it happen soon. We should not believe that only the future and the progress of the future will be able to improve the situation. We can do already much better today. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, I think we, we all agree that uh, we have moved certainly in a very impressive way. Uh, global average life expectancy has increased dramatically in the last 40 years. Uh, there's no question about that, but I think we've also been reminded today that the gaps between the best and least levels of achievement have almost never been bigger in history. And they still remain as a, a reminder uh, that uh, we cannot be smug about the achievement that we've made, uh, that we have to, in fact, think beyond past models and invent new ones. I think we are all aware, uh, and today our panel has reconfirmed, that nobody can do it alone, mm -hmm. that the public and the private sector need to work together hand in hand, that a policy framework and regulatory framework has to exist, and that's the primary function of the public sector, but not the only function, for it does support basic research, it does support other things as well, but that in the end, the private sector has a primary function in the uh, development and distribution and reaching the public in what it does, and that this complementarity of roles has to be recognized uh, and where it has been well done, uh, it has brought wonderful results. Mm -hmm. And yet, our world is full of challenges. Our world is facing not only environmental challenges, but also consumption challenges, and as well as the emergence of lifestyle issues in health, which are not just those that can be treated with drugs, or that should not be just treated with drugs, but should be also uh, uh, affected by changes in lifestyle. So awareness, involvement, and, and, and partnerships are required. And that allows me to end this panel by saying we started with 
three P's, PPP, public-private partnership, and I think we will end with four P's, people, public, and private partnerships. Thank you all, and we'll see you tomorrow.